with me is Ernesto Spinelli. Uh, he's an extremely influential psychotherapist and writer, mostly known for his work in existential therapy. In an international survey asking more than a thousand existential therapists what they consider to be the most important books influencing their practice, your book, Practicing Existential Therapy, was the most influential to come out in the last 30 years. <laughs> You're also a scholar in phenomenology, have been influenced by writers like Edmund Husserl, and have used his concepts and ideas into your own practice. Yeah. So thanks so much for having us, Ernesto. Thank you, my pleasure. Oh, it's great. So, existential therapy has come a long way, and in your career, it's also been a long, fruitful career helping that development. Yeah. Before jumping to your current ideas, I'd like to ask you how it started for you. Was there a particular book or offer that made a big impact when you were starting out? Uh, well, the way it started was that um, I was uh, teaching at an international college in London, and I was teaching various courses on psychology, uh, undergraduate courses. And I was asked to teach a course on humanistic psychology, uh, which I knew something about because I'd grown up in that period when it kind of blossomed and so forth. Um, but I didn't want to teach a course that was just going through the different uh, schools and approaches and so forth because it it was too messy in a way. <laughs> so I so I said, well, I'll teach it, but uh, what I want to teach is a course that looks at um, what might be the underlying philosophy or ideas mm -hmm. um, that unify all these different approaches, you know. Uh, mainly because I didn't know myself, and I thought, well, the best way of learning is to teach something. Uh, so, uh, so they agreed that I could do this, and so I began to read, and um, very quickly, um, existential and phenomenology were two terms that kept coming up and coming up and coming up. And um, I had heard of these terms, obviously, uh, mainly through um, when I was an undergraduate, when uh, the writings of R.D. Lang were very, very popular and very exciting and, and so forth. So I knew something, but only very vaguely. Um, and so I went to the college library and I went to the f uh, philosophy section and to phenomenology. <laughs> And there were, uh, there were some books by Husserl on phenomenology, so I thought, okay, I'll start <laughs> reading this. I picked one of the books up and started reading it and read it, and I, I couldn't make any sense of it. So <laughs> I, 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 you know, I thought, well, either, uh, either I'm really retarded or this is really different. So anyway, I read it, and, and, and for some reason, I kept on going back to it and reading it. And eventually, I think I got some idea of what <laughs> he was trying to say. Um, and in my naivety, I thought, wow, this is really interesting because it could... Uh, it could create a kind of new way of thinking about doing psychotherapy and, and so forth. I had had a background in psychoanalysis. I had started to train in psychoanalysis, and then I'd, I'd stopped. Um, so I had always had an interest in psychotherapeutic uh, ideas and approaches. But I, I hadn't come across something that felt like this, these ideas could be transposed to some extent to what was going on in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I discovered that any number of people before me had already had this <laughs> thought. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, you know, I, um, uh, I pursued it and I was lucky enough to get a contract to write uh, a book on phenomenological thinking as applied to psychology and to psychotherapy. This is the and interpreted world? The interpreted world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's where it took off, basically. Great. Actually, I was curious because you mentioned R.D. Lang. He was also a psychoanalyst who yes. had this existential bias. Exactly. So there is this bond between you and Lang immediately. 
Well, uh, <laughs> I would like to think there was. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, we got as close as talking to the, on the phone. It happened. Uh, we never actually met face to face. He, uh, he, he, he died just. I think it was in the same week that my my book was published. Really. Yeah, and I had I had had these dreams and hopes that he might read it or I could give it to him or whatever, but it it, ne it never came to be. But he, uh, you know, he remains a very important figure in my life. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I remember he died playing playing tennis. And yes, <laughs> he did. Uh, and his last words were, uh, "I don't need any bloody doctor." Yeah, yeah I think it was fucking doctor. <laughs> a fucking doctor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> More Langian. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and now jumping to a little bit of present history. Uh, yeah. What are your current views of the defining features of an existential therapist in comparison uh, to other modalities? Uh, uh, this is really difficult because one of the characteristic features of existential therapists is that uh, we won't agree on anything, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so we all have our particular views on uh, on this. And to be fair, um, uh, we are trying to. To work, you know, to talk with each other, which is a very unusual thing, um, and to try and figure out: uh, is there anything in common uh, that unifies us? You know, and uh, I think there's two things that I can say about that. The first is I think that more than the ideas as such, it's 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 the attitude. Um, that I think is a unifying feature. And the attitude, I think broadly speaking, is a kind of, a kind of skeptical position on psychotherapy itself and on the rules of psychotherapy, on the assumptions of psychotherapy. That would be a broad thing. Personally speaking, I think that what is unique, what's central to uh, existential uh, th therapy uh, and existential ideas in general is, again, not the usual things. You know, so people think of existential therapy, they think of things like death anxiety, they think of auth authenticity, they think of isolation, meaning. Um, all of those things are really very, very valuable, They're, and and obviously existential thought has a lot to say about them. But I think every form of therapy has something to say about those themes. So for me, it's the way that existential thought approaches these ideas that is what makes it distinct, rather than the the, the things themselves, you know. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I've tried to present a view that says um, basically I think there uh, there are at least three key principles that underpin the way existential th uh, thought considers um, human beings, you know, or considers existence in general. Um, the crucial one being what I've what. I and other people call relatedness. You know, this this basic condition of inseparability, you know, that I am, uh, and anything that I can say that I am or am not um, is, is not just dependent on some kind of internal psychic awareness and so forth it's a it's a relational understanding it's an understanding that emerges through all my interactions with the world and all the world's interactions with me um, and more deeply than that that fundamentally all these eyes that we are to me are an expression of a, a more found fundamental grounding that is unified, you know. So it's like we are we are distinct manifestations of a, a shared life condition entity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and I think when you start to see things in that way, uh -huh. 
then a lot of the language of psychotherapy, which is so individualistically focused, yeah. it, it, it's not that it becomes irrelevant, but you start to see it in a very different way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, it turns it around. Mm -hmm. I have felt that, uh, speaking of psychotherapy more broadly and taking yeah. what you're saying, that yeah. the evolution of the different schools actually kind of go with the flow of these ideas of relatedness. Mm -hmm. For instance, psychoanalysis became more relational. Yeah. Cognitive therapy is highly criticized for the lack of this relational yeah. aspect. Yeah. So there seems to be this move that you're saying towards this interdependence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the only thing I would say about that is that still uh, th there are different ways of understanding relational or relationality. Mm -hmm. And I think in the West we have a tendency to understand relationality as the interaction between two distinct beings, mm -hmm. you know, who come together in some kind of way. And I think existential thought takes this idea in another direction, that, that the distinct beings are really just an outcome yeah. of relation itself, you know? So it, for some people who study Eastern ideas, it has a, some affinity mm -hmm. with some Buddhist ideas, some Hindu ideas. Um, it's not the same, obviously, but there are points of, of contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, for many people, existential therapy was a discovery main, mainly through the popularity of Irving Yalom. Yeah. I know that you have your concerns regarding the identification of Yalom's four givens, which yeah. are death, freedom, isolation, isolation and meaninglessness. Yeah. You have your concerns that this is too connected with existential thought. Can you elaborate on this? Sure. I, I, again, um you know, I've got. Uh, I, I think those four concerns are crucial and critical. As I said before, I think for me the problem, though, is is that what kind of psychotherapy doesn't explore those four concerns? You know, so in that sense, if you're talking about the distinctiveness of existential therapy, then it can't be in the concerns themselves. And this is Yalom's point, you know, because he doesn't actually believe that there is such a thing as existential therapy. He believes that there are existential questions or issues that need to be addressed appropriately within psychotherapy. Yeah. So it can be psychoanalytic, it can be CBT, it can be Rogerian. It doesn't really matter. It's that these principles get addressed. Now, for me, like I was saying before, it's not the principles themselves that distinguishes existential thought, but it's the way these principles are understood mm -hmm. by existential therapy through this lens of, on one hand, relatedness, and then two other factors, this notion of uh, um, uh, a basic uncertainty in our existence, and the anxiety that is a, 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 a given of our lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so when we look at these notions like, say, death anxiety or whatever, or life and death, from this standpoint of relatedness, uncertainty, and anxiety, we get a slightly different or maybe significantly different understanding yeah. of, uh, in comparison to, say, the more individualistic views that many other therapies adopt. Yeah, which I guess uh, what also you're saying is that this inevitably leads to a stance, a phenomenological stance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, for some time I've been worried about uh, the ways that therapists find to defend themselves from mm -hmm. the client with, you know, concepts like, concepts like transference and resistance yeah, yeah. and through an emphasis on role-playing, yeah. playing an authority or something. Yes. I know you wrote about this in your book, Demystifying Therapy. Demystifying yeah. Therapy. I'd be curious to know your current thoughts on the ways therapists defend themselves at the expense of their clients yeah. and how you think this phenomenological stance can help us to balance that. Okay. I, I think I can put it into a nutshell. I think there's a basic uh, mantra that uh, uh, existential therapists should try to adopt, mm -hmm. which is the client is always right. You know, so if you take that position, 
then all these ideas of uh, resistance, of transference, of all this stuff just goes out the window. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 um, I find it really irritating, and, and I think it is largely defensive. Obviously, you know, if we're looking at things from a relational standpoint, it makes perfect sense that anything I'm saying to you probably has resonances with what I'm, you know, my interactions with my parents, my interactions with my cats, my interactions <laughs> with my friends, you know, with everything, with the world in general. But to give a particular significance that says, well, when I'm talking to you as the therapist, yeah. that somehow I'm not really talking to you, but I'm talking to somebody else, I find that really silly to, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it just makes no sense to me. So I try to work from the basis that whatever the client is saying, he or she is addressing it to me and to the world. Um, and I can look at it from both those perspectives, not either or, but both and. And equally, that even if what they're saying sounds completely uh, absurd or feels wrong or, or, or whatever, fundamentally what they're saying is right, even if I have no understanding of it. And my task is to try to understand mm -hmm. what it is that's there in their statements. Yeah. So there's this core validation of the subjective experience of the other. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you, you said one of your mantras, the client is always right. Yeah. I now want to ask you about another mantra I know you have, to, yeah. which is to describe something is to change it. Yes. Please explain this to us. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it's not, uh, it's certainly not a new idea. Um, uh, in, it, it basically, what, what it's saying is that the minute that you really start to focus in on some experience in a, in a fashion that really tries to um, clarify that experience without giving explanation to it or uh, a, a kind of analysis to it, but just really l examining as carefully as possible what that experience is, the magical thing is that the experience shifts because you what you brought to it initially is no longer held by you because you're you're seeing more of what was always there mm -hmm. so it's not like something new is being added it's just that you're experiencing more of what was present of what is present and for me the importance of this idea is that it seems to me that this is the key to the effectiveness of psychotherapy, of all psychotherapy. That it's, uh, you know, that we all have crazy ideas about why psychotherapy works and so forth. But that I think fundamentally, um, if you look at the kind of the commonalities of psychotherapy and the common principles of psychotherapy, I think then you, you realize that when, when the client is given the opportunity to be in a space that um, uh, that is both challenging enough and safe enough mm -hmm. to to address more honestly and more accurately what it is that the client experiences. Mm -hmm. Their experience changes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's it it's not really that surprising. <laughs> it reminds me of a. Uh paradoxical fear of change. I don't know if it's gestalt or something. Mm -hmm. That yeah. Change, yeah. to change yeah. where you are, you have to stay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of approaches have this understanding. It's just that I find that sometimes they tend to um, mystify it a little bit into kind of magical language of some sort or other when it's actually pretty straightforward, yeah. you know, just... Just examining anything changes what is being examined, and changes the examiner. <laughs> of course. How do you compare this approach then with Rogerian therapy? Because there is a very commonality between what you're yeah. saying and Rogers' thinking. Uh, there are uh, a, there are a number of commonalities. Rogers uh, always made it clear that 
the way that he developed his his model uh, was deeply influenced by his understanding of existential thought. I think what I would say is that while there are strong points of connection, uh, there are different important differences broadly at both a, uh, an applied level and a theoretical level. At a theoretical level, there is this tendency in Rogers, I think, to um, uh, to add to our sense of being human these notions of inherent goodness and so forth, which existential thought is much more cagey about. Mm -hmm. you know? We're human. We're capable of so many possibilities, some of which we might label as good, some which might label as bad, some which at one point seem good and at another point seem bad. So human, human existence is much more complex yeah. than I think the theories that Rogers would uphold would suggest. Yeah. At an applied level, I think that there is um, a questioning element in existential thought, um, an exploratory element, uh, um, uh, uh, an inquisitive element that um, uh, undoubtedly is there in person-centered therapy as well. But it's um, it, it uses description in a in a, in a different way, you know, it's a, it uses description to uh, to try to address what um, what isn't obvious in the statements of the client that that's there but is not being seen. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, to be fair, you know, I think probably a, a, you know. Uh, an excellent practitioner in person-centered therapy and an excellent part practitioner in existential therapy, if you see them working, at some level, probably you would go, I don't see too much difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think some differences would uh, eventually emerge, but yeah. there would be a lot of points of contact. Maybe one of the differences, the stance that you're saying, the pre-assumptions they have. I know that there was a friendly exchange of letters between Rogers and Roll May. Yeah. The American yeah. existential. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't that friendly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think. I mean, uh, and, and Rollo May brought this out with regard to you know, the question of evil um, and uh, Roger's incapacity to, to really address that question in a, in a genuine way or in a deep way. Yeah. There's one concept in your work that I find extremely useful, which is the idea of unknowing. Yeah. And for those not familiar with it, could you just tell us what that is? And if you yeah. recall a personal experience where you suddenly realized this was very important in psychotherapy. Okay, uh, it, the first thing is is that uh, the term I use, unknowing, uh, is UN and then a hyphen and knowing. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that I'm not suggesting a kind of erasing of knowledge or a blanketing out of knowledge. The un actually refers to uncertainty. <laughs> so it's, it's more like uncertain knowing. Mm -hmm. Um, and and what I'm trying to get across there is is the idea that when the therapist start, starts to listen to what the client is saying, obviously the therapist doesn't hear the client statements or respond to the client statement from a position of uh, a kind of blank slate. You know, the therapist brings all kinds of his or her own experiences, his or her own knowledge, understanding, all those things which can't be erased, but they can be placed into a context of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. They can be placed in, uh, in a point where the therapist says, yes, I have all this, but I can also take a stance that says, I, I, I might be wrong, I might not have understood, so unknowing is, is, is trying to get across this phenomenological idea of remaining open to what presents itself as, as much as you can possibly can. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You can't do it truly, yeah. but you can be <laughs> willing to do it. Yeah. You know, and that willingness to do it then allows you to hear the client as though, even though they've made the statement twenty thousand times, you know, it's it's like you've heard it for the first time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that you don't really know what the hell they're <laughs> they're actually saying. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So uh, I find this principle very useful. Uh, in in my own life, uh, not just in terms of <coughs> excuse me, in terms of practicing uh, psychotherapy, but you know, in um, in engaging with people, uh, in in my interactions with my friends or my wife or uh, colleagues or whatever, um, trying to you know, um, trying to stay with this open position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you asked me if I can think of a particular example. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if it's, the, if it's exactly the same, but the, this is what came to my mind. It's, it's an example that I've spoken about and written about. Um, I was working with a client who came to see me because she was getting more and more upset and disturbed by uh, her relation with her mother. Uh, her mother had developed uh, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, was in a home um, because she, she needed to be cared for 24 hours a day. And um, my client um, had initially been going over every, at least every other day, to go in and see her and speak to her. But she had found the experience more and more uh, irritating and disturbing and demoralizing and really sad because each time she went and, in, and she introduced herself as, her, as the daughter the, the mother would look at her and say, I don't know who you are, you're not my daughter, uh, and, would, and if, she in, if my client insisted, then increasingly uh, the mother would be getting more agitated, more upset, angry, and this was really upsetting my client a great deal. Anyway, we, uh, we had lots of discussions, and I think what, what what the key thing was that in the course of the discussions, even though we never, uh, I, I tried to listen to her from this unknowing position, and I think somewhere along the line, she picked up what I was doing. You know that I was kind of looking at things like they were brand new, and so one day she she came back, she came to see me, and and she was. You know, she was happy and uh, things had changed quite radically. And what had changed was that she had gone to see her mother this time, but this time, rather than introducing herself as her daughter, as the daughter, or even insisting that she was the daughter, she just sat down next to the mother and started to talk to her as though, uh, you know, she was a, a stranger of some sort who was just being friendly and talking to the mother. And as they got to talking, the, the mother asked her whether my client had any children. My client answered her. And then the mother started to say, I have a daughter, and, and began to speak about her daughter to her daughter. Okay. And in a way that really moved and touched yeah. my client, and she finally got that closeness that she was Walking for. hoping for yeah. and felt that she would never get again. But she only managed to do it by staying with the, where things were, yeah. rather than trying to impose uh -huh. her knowledge that she was the daughter, mm -hmm. Uh, onto onto the presence of the other. So that's that's it's a great story. Way of looking at unknowing. It's a great story, and yeah. you've talked about how you. This is also useful in your own life. Uh, one tries <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> this openness and unknowing that you're advocating, and that existential therapy seems to advocate in general. Yeah. It seems like a quite challenging enterprise for it a therapist. Is. Yeah. 
What do you find in your own practice to be the greatest difficulties in maintaining this phenomenological stance towards your clients? I think it is uh, precisely staying staying open to what's being presented, of not not trying to solve things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, I, I, uh, in the college where I used to work, it was on Baker Street, mm -hmm. and uh, every day I would come out of Baker Street Tube Station and there was a sh uh, statue of Sherlock Holmes uh -huh. just outside the station. And I, uh, uh, it hit me one day that, uh, you know, and I uh, tell, uh, tell this to students that you know, we start off in psychotherapy thinking that we're going to be the equivalent of Sherlock Holmes, but actually our task is to be more like Dr. Watson. Mm. You know, that, that if we, if, if whenever Watson tries to take on the, the role of Holmes, he really, he really makes a cock up. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I think that's what happens when as therapists we, we do that. So, it's more like we, we, we have to take a position that is an ally mm -hmm. um, and a very good ally and a very necessary ally um, to the, the great detective that is the client. Yeah. You know? When we play devil's advocate, because yeah. you are clearly, of, of course, talking about the more the relational and the validation side, yeah. what if a client uh, asks directly for a change? How, do, how yeah. is your stance towards that? I, I, like I said before, the client's always right. <laughs> you know, uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would basically take a position like any other of uh, initially, uh, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but I have no idea what you mean. Yeah. You know, so... Back uh, to description. I, I, so I will, let's go into the description. One, one way of looking at that might be to say... Let's say you got the change that you're looking for. What would be different okay. about your life? What would stay the same? Yeah. You know, just to help to clarify what the client is actually looking for. Because my experience has been that when clients come in asking for change, they're asking for the positive sides of the change that might happen. And they very rarely consider what might be lost yeah. to them in that change. Mm -hmm. And when they look at what might be lost, mm -hmm. they might change their minds <laughs> of wanting change, you know? So it's an awareness process. Yeah. So it's if you open the if you open the statement descriptively, yeah. then more of what the gain and loss of change will emerge. Mm -hmm so that the client can really have a sense of, I really do want this, or actually, mm, maybe as bad as it is, this is <laughs> as good as it gets. Uh -huh. it, it, again, it shifts the perspective on yeah. the issue. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. In one of his diaries, R.D. Lang once wrote, the self you are trying to find is the you that is trying to find the self you are trying to find. Mm. So you will never find yourself yeah. Since you have never been lost yourself, since yeah. the self that you had lost is the you that has lost it. Mm. Having said that, I'd like to ask you, who is Ernesto Spinelli? Huh. Um, you mean right now? Sure. Uh, someone who's engaging in an interview with, uh, <laughs> uh, with, with Alexandra and uh, uh, who is... Um, uh, telling himself, uh, oh, you're coming across like a truck driver again. A <laughs> truck driver. Yeah, I, I always, whenever I hear myself or read myself in interviews, uh -huh. uh, I, I, I get this image of, you know, me driving this truck, uh, uh, like, like I talk in a very uh, uh, uncouth sort of way. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Why is that? Yeah. Uh, that's what it feels like, you know. It, it's um, uh, I, I I I see myself in this very kind of elegant sort of way, but I never fulfill it. 
<laughs> well, I, I have a different experience from you, so yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, actually, that's not my experience at all. Uh, okay, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I quoted the R.D. Lang because yeah. I, I knew before, of course, that it was an important reference for you. It was also an important reference for me. Yeah. And since we're talking about early influences, I would like to finish off by asking you, what advice do you wish you'd have received when you were starting out as a psychotherapist? Mm. That's a that's a good question. I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, I I I mm, try and answer it in a slightly different way. Sure. Uh, uh, when I was uh, I, when I was doing my masters. Um, it was in child uh, development, and I was doing some uh, stu experimental studies on uh, the way children develop concepts. Mm -hmm. And in the course of that, I started to have this crazy idea that some of the younger kids were coming up with correct answers to the questions that they were being given, not through some kind of logical means, but through something that was quite close to what in ordinary language is referred to as telepathy. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, so this was a, a very crazy idea within psycho psychology. Uh, and I decided that I wanted to pursue this a little bit. Um, and my supervisor at the time uh, was basically saying to me, uh, Listen, you're going to ruin your career if, if you try to do something like this because this is just too absurd and too... You'll think you're transpersonal or... Yeah, exactly. And uh, then um, I, I, uh, another lecturer who was there who was uh, an expert on mind and brain studies and so forth, and I was talking to him, and he said to me, well, you know... Uh, don't forget what Freud said. Uh, and I said, well, what did Freud say? <laughs> and, and, and supposedly, uh, Freud said, with, uh, with, uh, when, when you have a small issue or insignificant issue, you know, treat it very logically and rationally and make decisions and so forth. But for the really important issues, go with, go with your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? and uh, and and that stayed with me. You know, I, I think that's been a an important factor in in my whole so called career. Uh -huh. You know that I've I've followed I've I've been lucky in that I my heart has led me to interesting places, uh, and I've not been too taken up with following you know the the logic and the. Uh, the rationality of my uh, of my thinking. Too mindy. Mm -hmm. So I would I would suggest something similar to to people who are beginning to train. You know, particularly when they're having to make decisions about what direction of training they want to take, or what you know uh, what the truths of psychotherapy are, and so forth. Listen, listen, uh, maybe more than just your heart, listen to your body, mm -hmm. you know, listen to how your body responds to the statements that are being made. And even if your mind is going, oh, this is wonderful, or it's going, this is, this is ridiculous, listen to what the body is expressing. And quite often you may find that there's a real contradiction between the two. Go with the body. <laughs> Okay, go with the body. Yeah. Ernesto, thank you so much for this opportunity. My pleasure. It was great. Oh, oh, great. Take care.